for many years were a paid employee of the U.S. government. And you think... I was not only paid employee, but uh, two of my bosses were killed by the Iranians. I've had Iranians working for me that were assassinated in Dubai. I know what the Iranians are capable of. I know what the Iranians were capable of from 1979 to 1996. They did blow up Kobar barracks. Um, they did attack the Israeli embassy in Argentina. And I can go on and on, but what we're looking at is the arc of a revolutionary power, irresponsible, irrational, uh, a, a, a ingrown hate. What has changed, the Iranians have grown up. You um, have already said to me that you think Iran has won, and when you say they've won, uh, I guess you regard Iraq as a very important part of their regional victory. But well, we're already hearing pieces of Maliki, the prime minister, is saying, let's get a timetable. You guys leave. Thank you. you you've, you've handed this government over to the Shia. All of the Shia parties I know, I used to meet them all through the 90s, every time... These men showed up at meetings, they had Iranian minders from Iranian intelligence, from the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the Ministry of Intelligence. You, you, you therefore posit that Nouri al-Maliki, the Prime Minister, or let's say another important minister whom we just had on this program, uh, Oil Minister Sharistani, they are nothing more than puppets, stooges of Iran. Uh, the puppets is a little bit strong. What they are is they n understand that the future of Iraq is closely tied to Iran. They cannot afford to alienate the Iranians. The Iranians have the ability to turn the table over, and if you're making a big decision and you're sitting even in the green zone, you have to go to Tehran and make a reference. This may change in 30 years, the old Persian-Arab divide, but I'm talking about now. You need refined fuel from, from Iran. The Iranians are key to Iraq's survival. But Mr. Sharistani sat in that chair just a short while ago, and he assured me that Iraq had no intention of giving up one ounce of its sovereignty to the United States or indeed to Iran. He is pursuing policies, particularly when it comes to the oil fields, which he says are absolutely in the interests of and all about the people of Iraq. I, I have no di doubt about his, his, his platform here. But Iraq is going to have a relationship with Iran as we have with Canada. Well, a relationship is one thing, but you're saying, you're saying to me that, in effect, Iran is about to annex Iraq. Well, what they've done is they've been quite clear, Shah Rastani has as well, he's on the record of running the new pipeline from Basra is going to go through Iran. That Iran is going to have a lot of influence over Iraq. When that pipeline that goes from Majnoon Field, 30 billion barrels, runs through Iran, the nature of the relationship has changed in history unlike we've ever seen in our lifetime. Do you seriously believe that the United States government, having spent trillions of dollars and having lost more than 4,000 lives in Iraq and knowing that Iraq's oil reserves arguably outstrip those of all other countries, possibly even Saudi Arabia, but certainly all other countries bar Saudi Arabia, you just think the Americans are going to walk away and leave Iran to do what it will? I think they'll put up a fight, put up a containment, but Americans are less likely to occupy Iraq than the Iranians are at some point. Look, what we did when we went into Iraq, what held Iraq together is not a nation. Three different sects, three different communities, the Kurds, Sunni Arabs, and the Shia Arabs. We destroyed the glue that held that place together. American and British troops cannot serve as that glue. So we're either going to have to restore the Sunnis in power like Saddam Hussein, or we're going to have to give it to the Shia. There is no choice. Iraq will never come back together. But when you say give it to the Shia, of course, Nouri al-Maliki is a Shia, but he isn't Iranian. And he would say he is Iraq's prime minister working for he, Iraq. He people. has to say that. He, but but he you, were, knows you were there during the uh, Iran-Iraq war. You know that just because an Iraqi is Shia does not mean that he sees a, a reason to be loyal to Tehran and not to Baghdad. We've got to look at Lebanon. Hassan Nasrallah is as Arab as you get and he is beholden to Tehran. He is a Lebanese nationalist, but he cannot move in Lebanon without consulting Tehran. He's an Arab. Does it ever strike you that perhaps you are overestimating the strength of Iran? I could be, but on the other hand, I've underestimated it for many years and suffered personally, and people around me have suffered. You have to follow Iran's arc when it was a country in 1981 was about ready to fall apart. 
19 years later, it's won a war against Israel. How can we ignore this war against Israel? In 2000, May 2000, the Israelis left under fire, got nothing they wanted. 2006, an Israeli column was stopped. They got nothing they wanted. This is the first time that Israel has ever been defeated in the field of battle, battle over a long period of time. That, this, is, this is huge in the Arab world. And if you're a Palestinian and you know the relationship between Iran and Hezbollah, who are you going to side with if you're worried about Israel? You're going to side with Iran. Who is the most popular leader in the Middle East? Hassan Nasrallah, a Shia. Who is the second most popular? Bashar al-Assad, a Shia. And the third one is Ahmadinejad. The, the, whole, the whole balance in the Middle East between Sunni and Shia has changed. No one would dispute that Iran has had success supporting proxies, guerrilla movements, particularly Hezbollah is, is a strong example in Lebanon. But look back home. If you are positing the idea that Iran is building an empire, is a superpower across the Middle East, how does that square with some basic facts? Unemployment in Iran, at least 20% if one doesn't believe the official figure, which nobody does. Electricity, in such short supply, they have four-hour blackouts already in Tehran, it may well get worse. We have a country which is rich in oil but can't even build refineries to give itself enough petrol to run its cars. This is a superpower? It's a superpower in that they control energy corridors. You look at the agreement signed between Turkey and Iran for gas supplies, either crossing from Turkmenistan or directly from Iran. You look at the agreement signed just recently between Turkmenistan and Pakistan. If the Pakistanis don't want to live in the dark, they're going to have to deal with Iran. You look, you look at the Iranian military and their silkworm missiles. They can take out the Arab oil overnight. They're military power. They're not an economic power. And the reason they're not doing economically well, partly at least, is because of the embargo.